Well, let me start out this morning by asking you a question. Uh, do you know who you are? Now, that's not, that's, that's not the, uh, you know, the Alzheimer's type question of do you know who you are, which reminds me actually of a story of, of, a, of an old couple, older couple, I'll say, older. It's not PC to say old. You got to say older. Uh, an older couple, and um, they were sitting around and kind of bored, and, and she said, you know, I have got a hankering for some ice cream, and I would love for you to fix me some. And he said, I'll be happy. Let me get that for you. So he goes to the kitchen, and there's all this knocking around, all this noise, and, and you know, and he comes back. And well, why, babe, I forgot something. While he's in there, she says, and don't forget the chocolate syrup. He said, I'm not going to forget the chocolate syrup. It's all good. And he goes in, and he's doing it all, getting everything ready, and he comes back in with, with some eggs. And she says, I knew you'd forget the bacon. <laughs> but anyway, and <laughs> so, so uh, April's concerned about me because my forgetter already works really good. Uh, and it's, it's, my forgetter is very intact, you know, and uh, so I um, have to write stuff down all the time. But now it's, not, it's not that kind of do you know who you are. It's, do you know who you are, child of God? Do you know whose you are? Do you, yeah, well, I know I'm a child of God. I know, I know. That. Do, do you really know? Do we really grasp the, the weight and the power and, and the depth of who we are in Christ? In the same book of Matthew, before we get into chapter 27, we see over in chapter 13, Jesus is sharing some parables about who you are. He says, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field, which a man found and hid. And from joy over it, he goes and he sells all that he has and buys that field. The man in this story is Jesus. The treasure is you. The word says we have this treasure in earthen vessels. You are the one for whom Jesus sold everything. So he could buy you, so he could purchase you, so he could redeem you with his blood. He continues, said again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking fine pearls. And upon finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Jesus is the merchant. You are that pearl of great price. And you are that, that pearl that he, he said, I, I've got to have. I got to have him. I got to have her. And I'll do whatever it takes to buy them back. And there was only one way for him to do that, and that was through his blood. Do you know who you are? Do you really know? Well, I kind of forget sometimes. Well, guys, I want to tell you, complete transparency, so do I. I forget who I am sometimes, too. I forget how valuable I am to the Lord. And I get self-centered, and I get down, and I, and I get whiny, and I look at the world around us, and I, I get more focused on that than I do on the Lord and His love. If we will grasp that one thing, what it took to buy us back, if we'll really get a hold of that and remind ourselves of that throughout our journey, it'll change everything. It'll change everything about us, and therefore it'll change everything in our relationships with each other. Because when we realize how valuable we are to God Almighty, when I consider the stars, the moons, the universe, the vast billions of galaxies all around, you hold those in the palm of your hand, you hold those and you sustain them, the word says, paraphrase, by, just by your word. What is man that you're mindful of him, the son of man, that you care for him? You do all that and yet you care for me. How can it be? How can it be that you are so vast, yet so intimate? That you are so powerful, yet so loving? You know the numbers of hairs on my head. And for some of us, that number changes daily. Let me just say. <laughs> Amen from this corner of here. <laughs> he knows us. And what, what it means, by the way, that he knows the number of hairs, that doesn't mean he, he counts. You know, he's, it means that he knows us that well. He knows us intimately, and he knows every moment. 
of every day, everything on our heart, every concern. We don't come to him and have to remind him, by the way, it's me again. You know, I'm the one who, yeah. You just call up in his lap and say, hey, daddy, I'm back. And he says, good, I've missed you. Even if it's been 10 minutes, I believe that's his heart. I've missed you. He never wearies of us coming to him. And we talked last week somewhat about how Jesus reacted when Peter blew it. Completely blew it. And just like Jesus said he would, you're going to deny three times that you even know me before the rooster crows, right? But we talked about how Jesus did not look at Peter with disappointment and shame. He already knew what was going to happen. He had said, you'll fail, but when you are restored, strengthen your brothers. And that's so encouraging to me because I think, Lord, when I mess up, when I have a thought or when I have an action that is just totally ungodly, the Lord says, when you fail, not if you fail, when you fail and are restored, strengthen your brothers. That's what he told Peter, and that's what he tells you and me this morning. We're not perfect. We are all children of Adam, but we're also children of God. And because we have that struggle within us, sometimes the child of Adam within us wins the battle, right? Sometimes the Spirit of God has the upper hand, and we submit to His power and authority and love and patience and self-control, right? I like to say there's those two dogs battling within us each day. There's going to be a battle between the old man and the new man. Which one's going to win? Well, it depends on which one you feed the most. The old nature and the new nature. Which one are you feeding the most? Are we spending time at His feet? Are we spending time listening to His Word, talking to Him about what's on our heart? Jesus has come to a place in His journey as our prototype, as the one who's gone before. And He has gone through this illegal trial. He's gone through just uh, this circus. The religious leaders are determined to kill Him and get Him out of the way so they can continue in their prestigious, powerful, wealthy position. They were some of the most wealthy people in the whole land of Israel, were the religious leaders, the Sanhedrin especially, the, the cream of the crop, if you will. And they have finally gotten Him to, to the place where He is being convicted, He is going to be tried, but they can't, because they are under Roman rule, they can't kill him. They have to run it past the Romans. And the Romans can't kill him for religious reasons. They don't care that he was blaspheming, according to the Jews. He was blaspheming, right? They don't care. So they have to bring a civil suit against him. So they have done the, uh, they've, had a, they've had a trial here in the evening. They've had uh, some time where they've brought Jesus and they brought charges and they've even brought false witnesses and it just totally was, like I said, a circus but they are not supposed to conduct such a trial in the, in the evening. And they're not supposed to make a decision in 24 hours, in less than 24 hours. They're supposed to conduct it in the day. They're supposed to give a night for the, the, those deciding the case to sleep on it and see if they'll be granting mercy the next day. They did none of that. Because God ordained that Jesus says the sheep before his shearers is silent, so our Lord would go willingly and suffer greatly at the hands of sinners. And so he did. Some have argued and said, well, the Jews killed Jesus. No, the Jews didn't kill Jesus. The Romans killed Jesus. No, the Romans didn't kill Jesus. You and I killed Jesus. It was my sin that killed him. He went willingly. As we look at these first verses in Matthew 27, you'll see something kind of comical that happens there in the first two verses. Let's look at that first together and we'll talk about it. It says, now when morning came... All the chief priests and the elders of the people took to counsel against Jesus to put him to death, and they bound him and led him away and delivered him up to Pilate, the Roman governor. Did you see that? It says they bound him. <laughs> they bound Jesus as if the Lord of all glory could be bound. No, he gave them the breath in their lungs, the heartbeat in their heart. He gave them the strength in their hands to tie him as he willingly submitted to them. No, they're falling right into his plans, not their plans, because he came to die. And again, since the Romans wouldn't care whether Jesus blasphemed, the Jewish priests now have to bring a civil charge against him. In Luke 23, we learn the three accusations that they brought 
to the Roman authorities. Luke 23, verse 2 says, And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this fellow perverting the nation, forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ, a king. They had to bring these kind of governmental charges, these kind of civic charges against him so that he would be tried. That was their only hope. And so they did. It's just, it, like I said, it's so comical that, that they bound him with a, with, a, with a thought. He could have legions of angels. As he said previously, 12 legions, meaning 72,000 angels, could come just at his breath, just at his bidding. But he came to die. And they take him to Pilate, it says, the governor. Pilate. His headquarters actually were in Caesarea which Caesarea is on the beach. So you can imagine this guy away from his homeland, away from Italy, you know, away from Rome. He's here been sent as this procurator or this governor to govern this land. And there was tension sometimes in Israel. So he's over a little bit of a difficult region. He didn't really like difficulty. In fact, Pilate was known and notorious for being cruel and ruthless, heartless even, uh, tradition tells us. And so here he is, he has to, Caesar tells him, Tiberius, you've got to go to Judea during the Passover and during any of the major feasts. And so he's there and doesn't want to be there. He'd rather be hanging out on the beach. I think I would too, be, rather be hanging out on the beach than go, you know, to a foreign land and, and, and govern and work and all that, right? So he's already in a bad mood and they're bringing something to him that's really going to get under his skin. He does have a palace in Jerusalem. So he's there at the palace at Passover. The crowds, of course, have swelled. Jerusalem has grown to about two million people during the, during the major feasts. People everywhere. He's already in a bad mood. And Pilate, you know, Pilate, uh, you think about, you, know, you first heard that before you, maybe you heard it before you read it. And you thought, Pilate, that sounds like a Pilate. Uh, it reminds me of a Sunday school teacher who was looking at the drawings of the last days of Jesus, and some drew the Lord's Supper, others had drawn the crucifix, but one child depicted the trial of Jesus. And everything looked great, but one thing really looked out of place, and it was an airplane with a man standing next to it, and when the teacher inquired, the child said, oh, that's Pontius the Pilate. <laughs> I mean, in, in their, their mind, that this, of course, duh, yeah, was, you got to include the Pilate, he was there which reminds me of the child who drew the manger scene. And maybe you heard this one, and maybe you saw this one. It's actually, it's floating out there somewhere, this drawing. And it's the manger scene, and he told this Sunday school class, because they, they were like, who's the, who's the rotund round guy there at the manger scene? Oh, that's round John Virgin. <laughs> that's all I got. <laughs> Thank God. Anyway, <laughs> thank you, Lord. So Pilate is here, doesn't want to be there, and, and they bring him this, this, uh, this trial, this, uh, this uh, convicted felon uh, who they say is an insurrectionist. And all, again, all these false accusations. Fulfilling prophecy, exactly. Look at Isaiah 53 and other places. They're just totally fulfilled, right in line with God's plan. And they're falling right into his hands and his plans. You know, and you think about the world today. I, I touched on news a minute ago and just, it, it's, it's a challenge, isn't it? To, to stay encouraged. It's, 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 and on the one hand, you, you see every day, you know, you get, maybe you get news bulletins on your phone like I do, or maybe you just watch the news or listen to the news. It's like something else happened. And it's just, it's, your heart sinks. And, and you think, on the one hand, Lord, how bad is it going to get? On the other hand, you think, Lord, come quickly. The, the, the Lord, the, the, the day is drawing near for the Lord to call us home, the rapture of the church. And you think, oh, i got to help, i got to share Christ with somebody. This really could be any moment. I, it's going to be, if they can't get saved before the tribulation, I need to make sure they get saved before the tribulation, but see, this is going to be hard for them to get saved during the tribulation. And think about 
all that goes on and, and all the stuff that you hear. And then again, it's easy to get discouraged. But God... And just like he was fulfilling prophecy then, church, listen, he's fulfilling prophecy now. These things must happen. The rise of the apostate church and all these things, we're not going to get into end times today, but all these things must happen. I believe there's going to be a great awakening before the Lord calls us home. But I do believe that days are still going to have to get darker before that great awakening happens because people don't awake until they realize they're asleep. People don't get born again until they realize they're dead. And so be encouraged, church. I believe it's coming. But hang in there because it may get darker before the great revival happens. Prophecy is going to be fulfilled. The, the specifics of the end times and all the things leading up to it, and the rise of Antichrist and all that. But be encouraged. God knows what He's doing. He is seated on the throne. He is not pacing around the throne. He knows what He's doing. In the meantime, draw close to the Lord. Seek where you can serve. Seek to, to wash somebody's feet. <laughs> to pour out your life. You only have this long in this life. Seek to serve while you're here and see what God does. So, with that, let's go to verse 3. Then when Judas who had betrayed him, and this is just kind of inserted by Matthew. In other, other Gospels, it continues on with the conversation with Pilate and all that. But here, it, um, Matthew goes back to the story of Judas and kind of tells his fate. And here it goes. Then when Judas, who had betrayed him, betrayed Jesus, saw that he had been condemned, felt remorse and returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests. And by the way, when he did that, it was almost as if he's blaming them too. Here's your silver. You're, you're at fault here too. Or he may have been also feeling like, I don't want this money, therefore I'm trying to absolve myself. Some combination of that. He said, I've sinned by betraying innocent blood. But they said, what is that to us? See to that yourself. Paraphrase, so what? They don't care. And he threw the pieces of silver into the sanctuary and departed. And he went away and hanged himself. Awful end to Judas. And the chief priests took the pieces of silver and said, It is not lawful to put them into the temple's treasury, since it is the price of blood. Let's pause there for a moment. This is amazing. They're, they're, so they're going to be religiously right and say this money is blood money. But they didn't want, so they didn't want to defile themselves with the price of blood. But it was the price they paid. They're the ones who actually paid the price. And then the money's given back to them. And all, but this is dirty money. Well, you're the ones, this is your dirty hands that made the dirty money. Such hypocrisy. Amazing. They were religiously right, but they were relationally wrong. And again, we've got to beware of the hypocrite in each one of us that will may say and do the right things, but in our hearts we need to be careful. Make sure that our relationship with God is tight. Make sure that we're not just crossing the T's, dotting the I's in our walk with God. You know, hey, hey Christian, how you doing? Great! Really? How's your heart? Uh, are you spending time with the Lord? Are, are, you, are you in the Word? Let's, let's learn from the, the hypocrites not to be those ourselves religiously right, relationally wrong. And they counseled together, and with the money, they bought the potter's field as a burial place, so they, they uh, sanctified their blood money. They cleansed it. They laundered it. <laughs> First case of money laundering right here in the Bible. For this reason, that field has been called the field of blood to this day. Then that which was spoken through Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled, saying, and they took the 30 pieces of silver, the price of the one whose price had been set by the sons of Israel, and they gave them the potter's field as the Lord directed. Isn't that amazing? As the Lord directed me, the potter's field. Prophesied right there. It's actually in Zechariah, and some say, well, that's because it was from the scroll of, of Jeremiah, which contains the book of Zechariah. That's probably where that's going there, uh, quoting that. But the point is, the Lord perfectly prophesied not only how the Lord would die, but also the events surrounding what they would do with the money, the blood money and all. That's just amazing. Now when Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor questioned him, saying, 
are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus said to him, now, in the New American Standard, it says, it is as you say. But, you know, when they put something in italics, those words weren't originally there. It's put there for clarity. It is as is in italics. So his answer was, you say. In our nomenclature, it would be, you said it. It might even be more slang, absolutely. <laughs> he is absolutely affirming that, yes, he is the king of the Jews. And, of course, the Roman governor, he doesn't know. He's thinking politically. He's thinking physically. Jesus, of course, is talking about a heavenly kingdom, earthly kingdom, spiritual kingdom, but not a political one. And while he was being accused by the chief priests and the elders, he made no answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many things they're saying against you? And he did not answer him with regard to even one single charge, so that the governor was quite amazed. Let's pause there. Isaiah 53, 7, again. Like a lamb before it shears is silent. He did not open his mouth. He went willingly. He could have said a lot of things to Pilate. He could have totally prophesied over Pilate, told him his whole life story. He could have looked into his eyes even and broken Pilate down. The eyes of God. Just think about that. Jesus didn't defend himself. And here's what one of my sources said about that. There's a time to defend one's cause or one's self. But those times are rare. Listen, church. When we rise to our own defense, we would usually be better off to keep silent and trust God to defend us. Man, I need to hear that this morning. I am so quick to defend myself. Instead of praying and seeking the Lord and saying, Lord, I, I don't really have a defense here. And really, I believe that the most godly thing for me to do is to shut my mouth. That's hard to do, isn't it? When you feel like you've been slighted, lied about, lied to. It's hard to keep your mouth closed. But our Lord submitted himself. He emptied himself of his divine power, submitting himself to the will of the Father, the power of the Holy Spirit, and here he is, silent, knowing that the will of God is going to be carried out, the will of the Father is going to be carried out in his life. Do we believe that? It's a challenge, isn't it? It is hard to believe that the will of God really is being carried out in your life, is it not? When you don't, when you don't see things, when things are looking pretty dark, he's about to be scourged. And then he'll be crucified. And we think we've got it hard. Yet he didn't open his mouth. Someone looks at us crooked and we start defending ourselves. You know, what do you say when someone attacks your Lord? When someone blasphemes, when someone says something just so offensive to the Spirit of God within you. That's really, by the way, what's really offended. It's the Spirit of God within you that's offended. What do you, what do, you do? Sometimes it's a good idea to stay silent and trust the Lord and pray for that person. I encourage us all to remember that this week because we will have opportunity more than likely. He didn't answer. He didn't open his mouth. It says Pilate was quite amazed. In another place it says he marveled greatly. Spurgeon explains why Pilate marveled greatly. He had seen in the captured Jews, other captured Jews, this fierce courage, this fanaticism, but there was no fanaticism in Jesus Christ. He had also seen in many prisoners the meanness which will do or say anything to escape from death, but he saw nothing of that in the Lord. He saw in him an unusual gentleness, humility, combined with majestic dignity. He upheld, or pardon me, he beheld submission blended with innocence. And again, imagine that. Now at the feast of the governor, at the feast, the governor was accustomed to release for the multitude any one of the, of 
any one prisoner whom they wanted. And they were holding at that time a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. When therefore they, they, had, they were gathered together, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? For he knew that because of envy they had delivered him up. In other words, Pilate knew the religious leaders were only doing this because they were envious of the following that Jesus had. And while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent to him, saying, Have nothing to do with that righteous man, for last night I suffered greatly in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the multitudes to ask for Barabbas and to put Jesus to death. And so here, Pilate sits on the judgment seat. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> the world sits on the judgment seat of Christ, and he will sit on the judgment seat of Christ as all of us face him. Two, two seats, two, two judgments, if you will. Judgment seat of Christ where our deeds will be weighed, see if they were selfishly motivated or see if they were heavenly motivated. And the ones that were for his glory and in service to others will last forever and ever and ever. And those which were not will be burned up, just pff, up in smoke. And then the judgment, and then there's the white throne judgment, of course, and that's where the Lord will judge the unrighteous. We don't go to that judgment. We don't have a, a ticket to that show. Thank God. Because we're covered in the blood of Christ. Those who are in Christ. And so, so here's, a, here's Pilate, a man who knows the right thing to do and knows it by many convincing ways, yet he will do the wrong thing. Why? Because the crowds told him to. He's following the, the, the will of the masses, if you will. In verse 21, but the governor answered and said to them, which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, then what shall I do with Jesus who's called Christ? And they said, let him be crucified. And he said, why? What evil has he done? But they kept shouting all the more, saying, let him be crucified. And when Pilate saw that he was accomplishing nothing, but rather that a riot was starting, he took water and washed his hands in front of the multitude, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it, see to that yourselves. And all the people answered and said, His blood be upon us and our children. Then he released Barabbas for them, and after having Jesus scourged, he delivered him to be crucified. And we'll pause there for today. Pick up next week. A few things I want to look at before we wrap it up. In verse 21 again, the governor answered, Which of these two do you want me to release? And they said, Barabbas. What about Jesus? Let him be crucified. Let him be crucified is really unusual for a Jewish crowd to even say. That was not their mode of execution. Theirs was stoning, right? But the Jewish leaders have been so influential in the crowd that they went through and they said, crucify, crucify. And they, they just planted those seeds because that was the Roman means, Romans means of, of execution. It was actually offensive and abhorrent to the Jew. They all said to him, there were none in the crowd who silently said, don't crucify him. Now again, we know there are some, those who are close to Jesus, perhaps were in the crowd. We know those who knew him better, but their voices were totally not heard. Really in crucifying Jesus Christ, humanity crucified its best friend. Jesus Christ was not only the friend of man, he took upon his a human nature upon himself, but he was the friend of sinners, so that he came into the world to seek and save that which was lost. And today, you look at Barabbas, and it's interesting, tradition te teaches us that Barabbas' first name was Jesus. Jesus was a pretty common name. So you got Jesus Barabbas and Jesus Bar Joseph, Jesus Christ, Bar, son of. And you have this interesting dichotomy. And, it, and it, just like the crowd chose Barabbas because they were influenced by those whispers, so we, influenced by whispers, sometimes choose Barabbas, choose the flesh, choose the way of the world over the way of God and the Spirit. They said, Barabbas, let it, give us Barabbas. 
if anybody knew what it meant that Jesus died in his place, it was Barabbas. He was a terrorist. He was a first century terrorist. And a murderer. He was an insurrectionist. He wanted to overthrow Rome. Yet he was set free while Jesus was crucified. The cross Jesus hung on was probably originally intended for Barabbas. They may even, maybe even had a name. Just we know there's a name plate on the cross of Christ. There was probably one with Barabbas' name on it. We can imagine Barabbas in a dark prison cell with a small window waiting to be crucified. Through the window he could hear the crowd gathering before Pilate, not far away from the fortress where he was imprisoned. Perhaps he could hear Pilate ask, Which of these do you want me to release to you? Surely he had heard the crowd shout back, Barabbas. He probably could not hear Pilate's one voice ask, What then shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? But surely he heard the crowd roar in response, Crucify him. If all Barabbas heard from his cell was his name shouted by the mob, when let him be crucified, or then let him be crucified, when the soldiers came to his cell, he surely thought it was time for him to die, tortured, suffer. But when the soldiers came and said, Barabbas, you're a guilty man, but you're going to be released because Jesus is going to die in your place. Barabbas knew the meaning of the cross better than most. Tradition also tells us that Barabbas followed the Lord. We've said Barabbas so much throughout our lives. You've been a Christian for any amount of time. You've said it over and over, but you've never perhaps said it the way it may have been initially pronounced. Barabbas. And you recognize the second part of his name because it's Abba. His name means son of the father. And so our Lord divinely designed that the criminal who would be set free, his name is Son of the Father. And he did that on purpose because he knew that there was a vicarious death that Jesus would die on behalf of Son of the Father so that each of us, son and daughters of the Father, would know what it feels like, would know a little bit about being found guilty before the Lord. The gavel has already come down. You are declared guilty. But yet before the scourging began, before the execution could happen, the judge stepped off of his podium, took off his judge robe, put on the garments of a common man, and said, I'm going to take the judgment myself. And that's a picture of what happened for Barabbas, son of the father, and for you and for me. We don't really fathom, we can't possibly fathom. The movie, we saw a little bit of it during one of the songs today, didn't show us the scourging, that's the most difficult part to watch in the movie, and yet the movie didn't even come close. Scourging in the movie, he was on a post, and they say sometimes they were on a horizontal beam so that their back would stretch even further and their arms were tied together so the skin would be stretched to the maximum. And many times, people would die during the scourging. It was 40 lashes minus one, and the minus one was Roman mercy. And the scourging implement was not a whip. It was a cat of nine tails, which was leather straps and nine pieces of bone and rock, sharp, objects, metal objects, that would cause the most damage. But here's something you need to understand about the scourging. If the person being scourged would confess themselves and or confess the accomplices who partner with them in their crime, they would receive a lighter scourging, maybe nine lashes instead of 39. Maybe it wouldn't be as hard because they had turned in their friends or even confessed to their own crimes. 
if they were silent, the authorities saw that as rebellion. And it was a much harsher scourging. They say that in the scourging, even organs could be exposed. As the, the skin was torn, the subcutaneous tissue, and then the muscle exposing internal organs. We don't know how bad it was or what Jesus looked like, but we do know the word says that he was not recognizable as a man. His beard had been ripped out by the soldiers. But why did he stay quiet? Because prophecy said he would, right? He stayed quiet because he had no defense. What do you mean? He's perfect. He's spotless. He's sinless. Yeah. But he stayed quiet because he has no defense because he was there for you and me. You see, if he had confessed to the crimes, who was guilty of the crimes, he would have said my name. He would have said your name. Here's the accomplices in my crime. But he stayed silent because he loves you, because he loves me, because he looked down from heaven and he saw the son and daughter of the father needed to be rescued, needed to be redeemed, needed to be snatched from the jaws of death, eternal separation because of our fall. But it's just not fair. It's not fair. And I don't want fair. I want mercy. When that judge stepped off his podium in his bench, took off his robe, that was mercy. A picture of God putting on human skin and bones so that those skin and bones could be ravaged in our place. Acts 3 says this, The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified His servant Jesus, the one whom you delivered up. He's preaching to the Jews, talking about what we just read about. And disowned in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. Pilate was ready to let him go. Especially with that message from his wife, right? And by the way, what was that? Why did God do that? God brought that dream. God gave that dream to Pilate's wife and the message to Pilate. One word, mercy. He was showing mercy to Pilate and to Pilate's wife. Tradition also tells us that they followed Christ, by the way. Later. Not sure how much later. What if Jesus showed up to them after the resurrection? It's okay forgive you, right? You can only imagine that. But you disowned the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you, but put to death the prince of life. What a, what a word picture there. Put to death the prince of life, the one whom God raised from the dead, a fact to which we are all witnesses. You disowned the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. Now, Peter's speaking to the Jews, but you understand. The Father disowned the Holy and Righteous One. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? For that moment, he had to disown him so that the wrath of God could fall on him. And you asked for a murderer to be granted to you. And he asked for you and me, guilty of every sin, We've broken all of the Big Ten. And he asked for us to be traded in his place. Barabbas, the son of the father. It's not fair. But that's what love does. Love sometimes does things that don't look fair. They look a little too self-sacrificial. Love is seen in action. 
Husbands, love is seen in obedience, children. Love is seen in service, everyone. Love is walked out as we have opportunity to serve one another. So, do you know who you are? You are the most precious possession in all the universe. Absolute, bar none. The most precious possession. And yes, I really do believe that had you been the only one, he would have done the same thing. Because love knows no limits. He's not going to wait for a quota. I really believe he loves us that much. You are the most precious possession in all the universe. You are the treasure hidden in a field. You are the pearl of great price. Okay, so what? How do I apply that to my daily life? Well, you've heard John 3.16 a million times, and you know he died for you because he loves you. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Whosoever believes in him will, yeah, we got that. But do you know 1 John 3.16? 1 John 3.16 gives us the answer to so what. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us. But that's only half the verse. So now we lay down our lives for each other. That's the so what. That's what we do. That's what love does. If I go all around all the time, and, and Paul wrote a lot about this in Corinthians, check it out, saying, oh, I just love God and I love my neighbor, and it doesn't show at all. There's no self-sacrifice. There's only self-indulgence. There's no acting out of that love. There's no laying down my life for my nearest neighbor, my family. And I'm, I'm totally not getting it. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us. We respond to that by laying down our lives for each other. But we're not going to be willing or able to sacrifice so willingly unless we first grow deeper in our relationship with God. Four things. Last thought, real quick. What do we do? In the silent times, seek God. In the painful times, praise God. In the terrible times, trust God. And at all times, thank God. Let's pray. And Father, we thank you that you have given us the greatest gift in all eternity. You've given us eternity. You've given us redemption. You've given us life. When we were dead in our trespasses and sins, because of your great love, you died in our place. We are sons of the Father, children of God daughters of the Father. And we have been bought back. We are all murderers at heart. Yet you set us free. And now we've been given a new name and a new nature. And we get to carry within us the person of your Holy Spirit. And we thank you, God. And here now in these closing moments with you, Lord, and, and, and each other, we just invite you, Lord, to search our hearts. We know intellectually that you love us so much that you died in our place, but we also know honestly that we're selfish. And too often unwilling to lay down our lives for each other. Forgive us, Lord. May we discover anew and maybe even discover for the first time this week how wonderfully liberating it is to lay down our lives for those around us. And we thank you, God, for giving us your strength to do so. Through Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen.